Man, this morning we were, we were kind of wrecked with our whole service. And, um, but that's what it means. That's the end then that happens. Because we expect to, to experience something that we pay for, something that, that, that we are prepared for, but God comes on the scene and then something happens. And it's the least of what we expect. But how many of you know that in the mystery, in the unknown, that's where you receive revival. That's where you receive that blessing. That's where you receive the miracle because you have no idea what you're going to receive. You have no idea what you're going to receive. You know, um, I, we, we were at a, at a buffet yesterday uh, for a friend's birthday and we were there. And, and the best thing about buffets is that you go for one round and then you go for another round. And then you go for another round. And then you go for another round. And it just doesn't end. There's always more and more and more. And with God, there's always more and more. Come on, just turn someone and say, there's always more with God. There's always more with God. You know, I'm just going to go straight and read from the book of uh, Nehemiah. Um, I've been reading my Bible with my wife recently. Uh, we try, we try our best to read it as often as we can. So we do this in the morning when we're going to work. And um, I was reading this, this scripture in uh, Nehemiah. And in the previous scripture, it's in Ezra. The previous book is Ezra. And it's about this story about Ezra who's been called of God to build um, the temple again in Jerusalem. Right? And he builds, he rebuilds the temple. And you've got to understand that way, way back in time, um, they've gone through so much of war, so much of, of hardship, and this temple is destroyed. And now he's building the temple again, rebuilding it. And then if you continue to read in Nehemiah, Nehemiah gets called from God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You know, any kingdom that, that has walls, the walls is, is its protection. The walls are what keeps the place fortified. It's what keeps the place safe. And so in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7 to 23, this is what happens. It says, But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. By the way, this is written from Nehemiah's perspective. So he's writing this. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to the work. How many of us have, have enemies in our life, have people in our life who, who, who point, point out what's wrong with us? They point out our weaknesses. And the devil does that as well. When the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great. He's awesome and he'll fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and a, and a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side and he worked. But the man who, show, who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out. We are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. You know what? God, God calls us to build things. He calls us to, to do things. But you know what? A lot of times we tend to lay down our guard. We tend to lay down our God. And in, in this scripture, I, I, I receive that because God tells us to do things. 
But we've got to hold on to our sword. We've got to hold on to our shield, to our armor. We've got to be ready for whenever the devil's going to attack us. For whenever people are going to say things about us, we've got to hold on to, to God. And keep building. We don't stop building. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. Don't let the enemy see your weakness as their strength. We may have some weak spots in our life. We've got to make sure that those weaknesses become our strengths. For me, that weakness was reading my Bible because I tend to read from Genesis and I'll jump here and there all over the place. But for the first time in my life, I began reading from Genesis and I got to the book of Nehemiah non-stop. That's an accomplishment for me. Maybe some of us, we've got to work on some of the the weaknesses in our lives. Turn them into strengths. And then in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 9, it said, When the Lord came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Jeshem, and the Arab, and the rest of our uh, Jeshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates. Sanballat and Jeshem sent me this message. They said, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messages to them with this reply and I said, I am carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? And then four times they sent me the same message. And each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, the fifth time, they started to lie. Sambala sent his aide to me with the same message and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, it is reported among the nations and Geshem says it is true that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to, take, to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. The devil will always try to lie. To lie about you to say things that are untrue about you, but we cannot be faced by that. I sent him this reply, nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of, out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak. But I prayed, Lord, now strengthen my hands. How many of us here today, we need to say, God, I need you to strengthen something in my life. And when, I, when the enemy calls out our weakness, God, strengthen me. Strengthen my hands. When, the, when, when that voice in your head says, divorce, God, strengthen my marriage. Nehemiah 6, 15-19, it says, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and they lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. You see, you cannot see revival. You cannot see victory if you get faced by every single small thing that comes your way. Or when it gets uncomfortable. Because we've got to keep pushing. We've got to keep pressing forward. Knowing that God is on our side. We fight for our house. We build our walls. We build our temple. I like what Pastor Lee Burns said. Um, he's, he's the... Vice Principal of Hillsong College, he said this, just because you don't see the promise right now doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just because you may not see what God's doing right now doesn't mean it's not happening. Just because we don't see air doesn't mean it's not there. So just because you, you think you're in a situation right now and God's not coming true for you, think again. Think again. I was sharing this story at the tribe service on, on Friday. You may not know about this. I'm so sorry, Avi. I, I didn't want to, to share. I'm probably going, Avi, can I share it? 
It's amazing. Avi, myself, Kevin, we were in a car accident a couple of months back. In a horrible car accident. And I got a scar right here to show. It's like this long line. Never have hair growing there ever again. And here's the crazy part. We, we, were, we were driving in this car and, and we made, made a, a bad turn and we hit into this lamppost. The car was totally messed up. I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. I hit my head on the, on the front of the car and I was bleeding as a gash. And um, I was sharing this with, with, with them on, on Friday. And I said, you know what? I keep thinking back to that day and I keep thinking, man, we could have died. And at that point in time, we, we, I mean, we laugh about it now, but at that point in time, it was freaky, it was scary because we hit into the lamppost. We were like, oh my gosh, we hit into the lamppost. Lamppost went down, car was in smoke and all kinds of stuff was happening. And I thought to myself, maybe we were supposed to hit that lamppost. Because if that lamppost was not there, we would have gone off that road into the fence and from, from what Kevin said to me just yesterday, there were nitrogen gas tanks right, right beyond those, those fences. It could have been way worse. Sometimes we think to ourselves, this problem is, is the greatest thing in the world. For all we know, that is what's what God has allowed to happen so that it avoids us from further damage in our lives. Because what we don't see, God is doing. Ever since that day, my seat belt is on. I drive at 60 km. I never make a left turn ever again. <laughs> we laugh about it now. Thank God we're alive. Thank God no one was standing on that sidewalk. Thank God for that lamppost, that God-forsaken lamppost. Thank God for it. God comes through for us in ways we least expect, church. That's what revival looks like. You see, we can only progress. We cannot go back to the way things were. You know, last week we had revival. How many of you were here in church last week? We had an amazing revival up here. People were on the front. We were praying. We were doing half for the house. Arms were stretched. And I was up there on base. I was right here. And I couldn't help it. I just went, Ah! God! Finally! Finally! Because a lot of times we feel for ourselves that, that we're just this far. And then you, you retract and you go back to where it was. But I don't want to go back anymore. That's why service can't look the same. That's why church cannot look the same. That's why we cannot stay back in our seats. We can't hold on. We have to go forward. We have to. That's revival. There is no other choice. There is no other choice. Because when, when things happen in our life, God is the one. And then something happens. But we cannot experience and then if you're not willing to to take a little bit of a step forward. If you're not willing to reach out our hands a little bit. My second point today is this. Jesus is the end then factor in our lives. There's this story about Lazarus in John chapter 11, verse 1 to 44. And Lazarus was the first zombie, right? He was the first zombie in the history of all mankind. Because God, Jesus raised him from the dead. If you read this story in the book of John 11 verse 1 to 4, go home and read it. Do your devotions on it. God brings the dead back to life. In this story, physically, the dead back to life. You know, Jesus wept for Lazarus because he knew Lazarus. Jesus understands our pain. He understands where we come from. And you know what's the funny thing about Jesus? He waited four days before he went to see Lazarus. Lazarus was dead for four days. You tell me, is that logical or not? If I want to save someone, I'll go as soon as I can. But Jesus waited four days because he wanted his glory to be revealed. If you read in the, in the Bible, it says, for his disciples, for them to see it, for Martha to see it. Martha is the sister of Lazarus. And so, 
when he went there, he called Lazarus out of, of the tomb. And Lazarus walked out. And we saw the dead bring, being brought back to life. You know what? The story is not so much about Jesus or Lazarus. I believe the story was about the disciples. And it was about Martha. Because this man had died and there is no hope. But Jesus was saying the situation, even if it means it's four days overdue, I can still do something. Even if the miracle is four years overdue, I can still do something. And He did it. And they experienced the miracle. The next scripture I want to read is from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. Slowly coming to an end right now. And so Jesus, this is a story about Jesus. He's, he's, he's preaching, right? And then he gets to this place where he meets this guy named Simon. Simon's a, a fisherman, all right? And this is what it says. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge, there were two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and said to him, to put out a little from one of the boats. Sorry, a little, uh, put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. This is like the coolest thing. Jesus is like savage. You couldn't just preach from under a tree or something. It's like, hey, there's a boat there. I'm going to get in this boat. I'm going to preach from the water. This is going to be amazing. Best church service in the world. You know, even Kanye West can't can compare to this Sunday service. But I'm, I'm going to preach on, on the water right now from a boat. I'm on a boat. And after he's done preaching, he says to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And then Simon says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in other boats to come and, and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. So much of fish, they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at, the, at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. For now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore. And then they let everything. They left everything and they followed him. We hear this story and we think, wow, Simon becomes a follower of Jesus. Let me bring your attention to what Simon was. He was a fisherman. And he experienced a miracle before his eyes. Two boats filled with fish to the point that the boat was sinking. This is his livelihood. This is his greatest moment in his fisherman career. He's about to make lots and lots of money. What does he do? He leaves everything behind and he just starts following Jesus. When Jesus steps into your boat and a miracle happens, your life changes completely. The illogical becomes logical. But you know what was funny? We think the story is about Jesus. The story is about Simon. Because Simon thought to himself, I'm, I'm going to be this pedestal for Jesus. I'm going to lift him up. I'm going to be that pulpit. I'm going to be like Pastor Ben lying down. I'm going to be that bridge that's going to help the people. I'm going to be the pulpit for Jesus. But little do we know, the moment Jesus was done, he turned to Simon I'm making you on the pedestal. I'm putting you on that pedestal right now, Simon. I'm going to do something just for you. I wonder if we, if, if we could be like Simon. Or if Jesus were to say to us, go out to sea, and we're like, God, ah, there's no point going out to sea. And we miss out on what's going to happen and then. My last point for today. God uses our end to fulfill His rendition purpose. You know, the word rendition means interpretation. Whenever we experience an end, it's up for interpretation. 
Because with Jesus, there's always an interpretation to the ending. You know what I, 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 I'm, I'm really frustrated about? I've been really messed up in my life. You know why? It's because of Marvel movies. How many of you watch Marvel movies and you stay till the end credits? Even when there's nothing at the end? How many of you, when you watch other movies, it's not even Marvel, right, bro? Like you go to another movie and you sit and you're just like, you're hopeful because there could be something at the end. They've completely messed up my life because I sit in the cinema until the guy comes out and sometimes there's nothing. But I still wait. You know why? I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out anymore. We may think it's just the end, but there's an interpretation to what the end really is in our lives. God can take any mistake and He can turn it into a victory. He can take any ending and He can turn it into a beginning. I've got a really good Christian book here with me. It's Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. This book was banned from my house. <laughs> because I'm a good Christian boy and I don't read this kind of stuff. That's not true. I actually have all the DVDs. <laughs> but do you know that Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone was written by this, by this author. Her name is J.K. Rowling. Right? The first, the J.K. stands for just kidding. <laughs> actually, I have no idea. But did you know the story of J.K. Rowling? She was fired from her job. And when she was on a delayed train to London, she wrote the first few notes that was Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Okay? She later on compiled the book and she submitted it to 12 different publishing houses. Every single publishing house said it was a horrible book. We're not going to publish it. It's not going to be profitable for us. You've got a mistake in your hands. How many of us here today we try and we try. We try maybe 12 times. But 12 times back, someone says to us, it's not going to happen. But you know what? Sometimes when you have 12 people, 12 groups of people that say that to you, maybe you start to believe it. Maybe one or two, yeah, no, I, they, they got it wrong. But 12 different groups of people, maybe they are right. Maybe I don't have anything. Maybe there's nothing to this. You know that after she got rejected by these 12 publishers, a year later, one publishing house, Bloomsbury Publishing House, they are laughing right now because they are making so much of money. This one publishing house said, we'll do it. We'll publish your book. This happened one year after. One year after. And today, that's, it was like, that started... Well, that was the start to more than 500 million books being sold. And she's currently the UK's best-selling living author. I wonder if she just retracted from, from that moment and said, you know what, maybe they are right. If she did that, then there would not be any end then. She would not have become the UK's top best-selling, living author. We will not see the Harry Potter series like we see it today. It will not be existent. I wonder, church, if today any one of us, when God is telling us we're, He's going to do something in our lives, are we willing to just wait for that extra one year? Are we willing to wait for another person to say yes? Or are we going to retract the moment we get 12 no's? Because that's not what revival looks like. Can we get the worship team up? You see, if we give up too soon, we will not see God's goodness. If we give up too soon, we will not see His provision in our lives. If we give up too soon, we will not see His purpose come to pass in our lives. You know, we did hard for the house the other day. Could I have that? Not this thing, yeah. Thank you. You know, last, last week I was with my wife at home and we were filling this thing out. And we filled out one for Heidi as well. We just put words into her mouth. <laughs> and we were filling this thing out, right? And I wanted to fill up everything. 
I took up every single line. I filled up every single line on this thing. And then I started to fill up the bottom here. I was like, babe, what else should we write? Because I wrote about everything about myself and my family. Then I started to think about, what about other people? Let's write down for other people as well. I wrote down all the other people and everything else that I think people would want. You do not know this, but we wrote down about you guys. That you guys will get the, the car loan. And on, on a Tuesday at, at Connect Group, he told me they got the loan. They got the loan. You, you may think it's nothing, it's nothing much, but Roger and his wife are entrepreneurs. They're self-employed. How many banks are willing to give self-employed people loans? It's not that easy. And then I wrote everything down. And I came to the bottom, I'm like, babe, what else can we write? She's like, I don't know. I'm like, you know what? Point number 19, everything. God, I am, we are believing God for everything. You know why? Because I don't want that, that, that two months down, down the line that, that I suddenly think to myself, oh, I forgot to write something down. No, I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out anymore. I don't want to, to experience God's presence come and go. I'm believing you, God, for every single thing. And I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. I don't want to miss out on and then in my life. I do not want to miss out on and then happening in this church. That's what revival looks like. And so today, church, we're going to come to an end right now. And, and is, is Matt there? I'm going to ask you guys to take a step of faith today. Would you stand to your feet? And we're going to do something that, that's, that's a little bit different. But you know what? Come on, tell the someone and say, this is the new normal. Because it is the new normal. It is the new normal. I want to encourage you. Would you come to the front? Would you just fill up this space over here? It's okay. Just come. Even if you're young, even if you're old, just come to the front. Come on, guys. Don't be afraid. We did this last week. We're going to do it again. And we're going to continue doing this because I do not want to go back to where we were. We cannot. We cannot afford to go back to where we were. You know, I'm a business teacher from Monday to, to Friday. I think about companies like Nokia. I think about, about Kodak. And I cannot go back. They, 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 they went back to where they were. Look where they are now. We cannot go back to where we were. We cannot. We don't take for granted. But if you've never prayed and asked Jesus to come in your heart right now, we're doing it together. And if that's you, if you've never said the prayer to ask Jesus to come in your heart tonight, tonight this morning is, the, is your time. So let's pray it all together. Say, Jesus, Jesus I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for dying. And for rising again for me. For I give you my heart. I give you my life. And I say yes to you. Use me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 We've got a Bible outside for you. If you prayed that for the first time, please grab it. But we're going to worship God one more time, then you're free to go. But God's doing something in this house. So don't be quiet about it. Tell someone about it. Drag them to church next week. We're going to believe God for more. There's always more. Amen.